Thank you very much, Salvatore. It's great to be here. <laughs> uh, I think I probably disagree with their proposition, <laughs> but I'm sure that won't come as an entire shock to you. Um, no, I, the basic uh, premise of the book is that um, there's a kind of hierarchy at work here. Uh, we definitely have a phenomenon called economic prosperity. Everybody understands prosperity. Um, they know it, they feel it in their bones. The question is, how does it come about? Um, and I think the principle most powerful economic driver of prosperity is productivity. Highly productive nations are uh, prosperous nations. And the interesting question for me is um, what drives, what underpins productivity? Uh, productivity is the economist's kind of question, uh, but I come from it from a broader social science perspective and I ask the question, well, what kind of social things uh, drive or influence uh, economies or societies that are highly productive? And part of the answer to that is productivity is based on ingenuity and ingenuity is based on imagination. And really what I'm trying to explore in this book is, um, how is it, some, some of the deeper underpinnings of productivity that reach down into things like um, social imagination. And I asked the question, to what degree is um, social imagination uniform across nations and to what degree is it not uniform? Well, there are certainly, um, how is it, government departments and institutions across the world that tell you that uh, all their society is uh, creative and that all societies are equally creative. And if you, in, if you spend enough money and you introduce a series of protocols and procedures, magically uh, um, um, and creativity and the imagination will flourish. However, uh, that's clearly not the case. And uh, you know, we have now a long um, experience of the kinds of things that um, generate um, you know, creative endeavor in societies. Uh, I think like many of the most interesting, what we call social characteristics, um, they tend to be not uniformly distributed uh, across nations, but uh, very significantly from nation to nation. And that's certainly true of creativity. We can measure this and uh, spend quite a bit of time in the book looking at certain measurements of creativity. Uh, we have on the one hand, institutional measurements of creativity, like the, um, the amount of you know, copyrights per capita uh, or the number of patents registered per capita and these kinds of things. And that really represents um, creativity in an institutional organizational sense. But it's also clear that that is the sort of, how do I describe it, surface phenomena of um, economically and socially creative societies. And, uh, you know, beneath the level of institutions, there's also always the more interesting uh, kinds of mechanisms and phenomena at work. And really what I'm trying to do is dig down deeper into those mechanisms.
Well, um, Anthony's raised two very interesting questions. Um, I'll, I'll come back to, to the first issue that he raised, is everybody creative? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, and we, we might discuss this further later in, in, in the program, but Anthony is spot on. Um, creativity in whether we're talking about it in terms of the creativity of, you know, technological scientific ideas, or we're talking about sort of, you know, more routine innovation in society. Um, it, it tends to be overwhelmingly the exception uh, rather than the rule. Now, as far as difficulty goes, difficulty is fantastic. Um, difficulty is something that anyone who is creative loves a challenge. And, uh, I'm sure Salvador loves a challenge. Uh, and I think this is... <laughs> Ah, uh, well, that, that's a recipe for a, a, a decadent and lazy society. <laughs> yeah, no, Anthony's spot on. And the thing about, one of the interesting things about the, the profile of, of people who are genuinely creative, it could be in business, it could be in philosophy, uh, it could be in whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. Those people have one common character trait across the board, it's well-researched, well-understood, persistence. And persistence is a character trait that you need when you face difficulty in life. It doesn't matter whether it's personal difficulty, intellectual difficulty or whatever. People who deal effectively with problems and work out solutions to problems, they need, I think, they need to be persistent because problems by their nature, if it's difficult, it takes time. And I think the other kind of um, thing that's often correlated with that, both on a personal and social level, is adaptability. Um, often the best problem solving comes from both individuals and societies that are adaptable. And part of the thing about adaptability is you, a solution, a serious solution, an interesting solution is something that's um, uh, by definition new or untested. And uh, in order to implement it, it needs a certain degree of adaptability or flexibility. And we see that every day with the, the difference between a successful company in the long term and a company that's unsuccessful in the long term. It's well known that long term successful companies uh, are adaptable and or, you know, if you want to use the fancy lingo of the day, they, they reinvent themselves. But that simply means that they, they face these challenges that Anthony talks about, they deal with them, they address them, and in some important way, they move on. Um, but at the same time, they have a capacity to retain their long-term identity while at the same time doing that kind of moving on. Yeah. Absolutely. You, know, you can't have a successful society without having a very strong sense of, of um, uh, private property. Um, it, it, I think there's two aspects of it. I mean, the first aspect of it is a strong system of private property um, ensures uh, f um, you know, durability, stability, a long-term sense of um, you know, established identity in a society. So one of the ways that human beings construct their identity is around and about the things that they possess and they own and the durability of those kinds of things. And but there's an irony involved here, a paradox involved here. And the irony and paradox is that if you have a settled identity embodied in property or anchored in property, it means that you enjoy a certain kind of personal and intellectual security that allows you to go out and explore the world, to discover things, uh, to think hard about things, and to engage in that rather kind of obscure and protected process of imagination. And, and that implies both to individuals and also at a social level. Hey, Kate. Um, Mary, interesting question. Probably the answer is no. Um, I, the qualification to that is that 
Um, I think historically speaking, some societies are better at engendering you know, imagination than other societies are. Um, it's again, not a uniform process historically. You, each society that's good at that tends to go through periods, you know, a number of decades when they have a, you get the kind of golden age. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's an upspring, an upwelling of, of creative endeavor. Um, you know, uh, um, in the second half of the 19th century, uh, Britain and, and Germany in science were fantastically creative societies. Um, and, and you get these golden periods. And the thing about the golden periods is that they never last. Um, they exist for several decades and then they sort of um, they disappear um, or they, they become reduced at, 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 at the very least. Um, can this be taught? Um, the thing about teaching, and I think I'm sure Salvador will appreciate this, principally the point of teaching is to convey established knowledge. Um, you know, the classic thing, of course, is the, I think the proof against teaching as a creative medium it was poor old um, Isaac Newton when he invented his fantastic new um, uh, physics in the 17th century. And he would turn up to classes. Um, you know, he was, an, he was a very well-respected intellectual at, um, um, at, at Cambridge. And he would turn up to classes. And lo and behold, there would be no one in his classes. The reason being, of course, that he was using a forms of mathematics that were simply the students had no way of understanding because they hadn't become part of the mathematical orthodoxy of the time. And essentially to be effective at teaching, you need to be able to rest upon an established body of knowledge that ultimately, let's say in the 20th century at least, could be reduced to textbooks. Um, and and uh, so no, teaching probably not a, a, a very viable medium for cr imparting creativity. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is, um, and uh, it's absolutely essential. And it's clear again, um, societies that have, uh, you know, established track records, historical track records of measurable high levels of creativity. And there's, as I said before, there's a number of different measures from institutional to non-institutional. Um, they are free societies and um, free societies allow the expression of non-orthodox or dissenting or minority opinions. And it's those opinions in the end, if we look at the history of science or social sciences or whatever, those opinions may struggle initially. They may not attract, um, you know, a large body of support. Uh, but the, the fact that they're articulated allows them over time to move from being heterodox to orthodox in due course. And the only way that that can happen is that there is freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, um, the ability to um, make cases for uh, opinions that the majority of people, whether it be in the broader society or in universities or in corporations or wherever it is, simply don't agree with. And um, they have to be able to tolerate the expression of that opinion. And of course, as we know, the past decade or so um, in Western societies has been a, a very poor period for creativity. Um, and because there's been um, the barriers to free expression have grown um, quite, um, quite significantly. And I have to note in passing here that at the same time that has happened, we've seen uh, across the um, you know, OECD type societies, 
uh, a significant decline in, in productivity and in technological and scientific development. And these things tend to uh, go hand in hand. So you, you don't have a great economy, you don't have a free and relaxed society without one of its essential ingredients being freedom of expression and freedom of opinion. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I guess I have a, a kind of mixed reaction to, to when I think about their importance. Um, I think copyrights and patents are very effective in, let's, it's, let's say, the, the medium term development of, of creative enterprise and organization and so on. Um, that is to say that they are a recognition, a legal recognition that um, uh, important and, and essentially productive ideas, whether it's economic or socially productive ideas, they have a, a measurable economic value and um, they return that measurable economic value to, to the people who um, invent the ideas. And, and remember, great ideas take time. Um, so that, uh, you know, uh, the, it's again, well-established in, in a quite interesting creativity literature um, that, you know, it, it's not uncommon for um, what people think are, you know, uh, um, um, sparkling creative developments to actually take a decade, sometimes two decades, three decades, you know, take the case of the mobile phone, for example, um, you know, it, it's it's something that has each of us. It's changed our life in quite you know significant ways, tangible ways. Well, really, the technology of that, in fact, goes back to the 1920s, and um, the first um, you know working kind of semi-commercially available mobile phones appeared in the United States in the 1940s. So lots of people involved in long-term process of development. And um, if you're spending a lot of time doing stuff, you do need to be rewarded for, for that activity. However, that applies, I think it, there's the, there's in, in society and econo in economies, there's the, the micro level, the everyday level of interaction. There's a middle level, which involves, um, I mean, institutions and um, and kind of you know, networks of behavior and and then there's a kind of top level and I think we need to distinguish that in terms of creativity I, I, institute patents and copyrights I think apply to um, you know sociologically speaking the middle level uh, tier of activity in society and I think the one thing then I become very skeptical of is the idea of infinitely extending, for example, copyrights. Um, I mean, Thomas Jefferson was a great pioneer of copyrights and the original copyright legislation that he introduced was for, gave copyright to the creators of ideas for 17 years. And now we're up to 70 years. And I think, um, you know, uh, uh, the Disney Corporation will want to have a millennium copyright. And I, that just becomes, ridiculous basically and and it's at that point when when you really push the envelope in terms of time that you start to run into problems okay <laughs> well mm, it this is and and interesting question and I certainly in say the universities for the last um, you know 30 years you, in, and I think also in secondary schools education uh, we we have this kinds of arguments about thinking versus knowledge and um, uh, I think overall I tend not to be 
particularly sympathetic to the distinction because in the case of thinking and particularly the very rare form of thinking, imaginative thinking, it needs to be built on knowledge in the first place. Um, people who are creative and significantly creative come at a problem or an issue uh, with a huge knowledge base behind them. Um, and, you know, we, we see this, for example, with, um, you know, pop music bands, for example, if you look at the history of pop music bands and the really successful ones, genuinely creatively successful ones, of which, like in any endeavour, there's a, a small percentage of the total population falls into that category. And you read the histories of those, um, in that their musical endeavour, what you find is that they spent, you know, frequently a decade uh, learning their craft. You know, they started at 15 and then they reached their creative peak at 25. It takes a long time. And, and I think that that's, that's true of, um, how is it, um, you know, creative endeavour um, in, in its, um, how is it, across the board. You know, you read again, his, Einstein, for example, you know, the, the classic, perhaps cliched example of scientific creativity. But, you know, he spent a lot of his teen years reading, um, you know, books and materials on, um, on classic geometry. Um, and, you know, you can see in the, the, the lead up to his breakthroughs in the early 20th century, um, he, he was invoking a particular kind of knowledge, which was he wasn't building necessarily and directly on the knowledge or scientific knowledge of the late 19th century, but rather in a curious way, he was stepping around that and digging deeper into other knowledge bases, which allowed then subsequently for him to make the breakthrough. But you cannot make breakthroughs without having significant knowledge. And that's where teaching comes into play, um, that um, you know, teaching needs to be able to convey knowledge and yes, as you advance through the teaching system and on into universities, then, um, you know, teaching is gradually replaced by thinking. And I think, you know, in the classic form of the university, I mean, if we go back to, say, the early 19th century with the development of the German universities, which became the model for the American research university, um, you know, when you went to university in the, in the 1830s and 1840s in Germany, that's what you did. You literally went to a place, you could go to classes or not go to classes. You spent four years, you weren't continuously examined on your knowledge. And, you know, in the fourth year or whatever, you produced a thesis and you were either, you know, you passed or failed the thesis and so on. And what that meant was a form of freedom that the university was, the knowledge was available, but it was assumed that you were a potentially thinking person and a potentially thinking person is that they um, explore knowledge. They go from one item of knowledge to the other and they draw connections that other people have not previously drawn. And that's a definition of the creative process. Okay. Yes, um, and <laughs> um, I, I introduce irony in the book uh, because part, partly because to a degree it's a measurable phenomenon. Um, and hey, it is measurable because uh, we we can uh, measure um, uh, the the volume of um, you know. Uh, irony, I use the example of epigrams as, as, as a measurable unit of irony across different cultures. And, you know, we have enough literature on the history of literature uh, to be able to make a pretty reasonable stab at, at, at measuring that as, as, a phenomena, as a phenomenon. Now, the thing about irony is that it, like um, paradox, does uh, what creative people typically do. Um, they take two things in opposition and put them together. You know, classic example of, of 
from economics of the 20th century was the notion that less is more um, and the notion that in order to be creative, you also need to be destructive. Um, and they became kind of measures of, of or rather maxims rather, of what a creative economy looked like. A creative economy was full of people who assumed that doing less things created more wealth and doing things in a destructive way was also the pathway to doing things in a creative and productive manner. And, they, and they're both forms of irony. And irony is tremendously productive in the sense that it allows you to think about things and to approach things and in fact to solve problems in ways that in everyday life or in normal institutional life, we don't go around, we don't use those kinds of thinking processes. But when it comes to doing something like developing, you know, an iPhone or um, a computer system and, and those sorts of things, the great breakthroughs require us to think in different types of ways. We don't do it all the time. It's rare. It's the exception. It's not the norm, but it's incredibly powerful when it's applied in certain ways. And that's the virtue of of, of irony. It simply is a way of summarizing the notion of putting things together that don't normally go together that provide those cloud bursts of creativity that we so enjoy once they're done, not in the process of actually doing them. It is ironic, Terry. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank you.